Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. We are an open dialogue on education, the arts, and social change. And today we are with one of our favorite people in the world, Foster Hirsch, uh, one of the world's leading film historians, film critics, film educators, and film interviewers. So I better be on my best behavior interviewing the interviewer here, okay? But, uh, you know, as someone like me who grew up, my father was a projectionist watching movies as a kid. I just absolutely love movies. And only recently I discovered that my grandmother's second mother was Blanche Walsh, who was the first American movie star in a movie called Resurrection in 1912, which Adolf Zucker used that movie to create the notion of a star, of a movie star. It's now a lost film. I'm trying to call on the world to find it and search for it and resurrect that film. But to be with a man, Foster Hirsch, who Claudia and I first met in Jersey City at the Jersey Lowy's, uh, giving an introduction to Wuthering Heights, and have since seen him several times at the Film Forum, introducing films. He is such a, a delight and pleasure to be with, to inspire not only a love for film, but also an analytical a take on cinema and how to think about it and talk about it. So we want to have a delightful hour with Foster in his lovely West 12th apartment in Greenwich Village. This is like a dream with movie posters and uh, movie ephemera everywhere, which we're going to take a look at later in the show. But let's just begin by welcoming Foster. And why don't we start with how did you develop such a great love of films? Talk about your life and growing up and what were some of the seminal influences? I, I think like a lot of people who are lifelong movie fans, it came from my parents. My parents were both lovers of movies. So I was taken to movies from a very young age. But it was interesting because they liked different genres. My father took me to westerns and my mother took me to melodramas. <laughs> both my mother and father hated comedies. And to this day, I have very little interest in comedies. <laughs> I, I have been teaching uh, film at Brooklyn College for almost 50 years now. Never comedy. I don't think I've ever taught a comic film. I don't have any patience for it. But you like Woody Allen, though. Well, I did. Yes. Okay. I did. <laughs> I did. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I like him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I appreciate what he's done. But that was, that's my one departure. Yeah, that's not my genre. It's not my genre. Uh, but he's a great filmmaker. Yes. But most of the, the comic films are not great films, in my mind, visually. Yes. But for me, they don't hold up, and they're very hard to teach, actually. I admire people who can teach them and write about them. They're hard to write about. Wow. Because what you think is funny, yes. the next fellow may not think is funny. That's and true. what was funny 20 years ago may not be funny at all now. Comedy is extremely demanding as a genre. But as I tell my students, it should be obvious that I don't like comedy because can't you tell I have no sense of humor? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's interesting. I, a lot of my own love of cinema also came from my grandmother, who is 97 years old now, okay, and she grew up watching the golden age of Hollywood, you know, and those movies are very important to her. Uh, but she was always frustrated because my grandfather would sit through a movie with his arms crossed like this and say, oh, this is so unrealistic. This could never happen. This is no, you know. That's so that they had a clash. They had a clash on that, you know. And um, But like I said, my father uh, took me to the movies as, as a child. Uh, my mother was a big fan of, of Woody Allen, of Jerry Lewis. So I got into comedy, I think, more also through my mother. Um, and... Uh, Discovering the film forum was very important to me because then I realized that film can also be a, a more serious medium that you can think about philosophically and thoughtfully. It's kind of like a church for cinema. So how did you get deeper into cinema? How did you go from having a love for cinema to really taking it seriously? Because at one time, cinema studies is actually a, a more recent uh, major that you can study in college. I think you were one of the pioneers of cinema studies. Talk about that. How did you start that? Yeah. 
actually uh, my deg my advanced degrees are in English, and because in in my day, which goes back a while now, just as you said, cinema studies was not considered a valid academic field. In fact, it was looked on with a little suspicion. You know, too easy, or it's just an avocation, or it's just fun, and but it has since become a serious discipline. But that was since I was in graduate school. When I was at Brooklyn College, I was in the English department, and a film program started up, run by the speech department, and they knew that I had been publishing reviews of films because I had started reviewing, including some articles for the Times. And they said, would you like to come over and teach a course for us? And I said, of course. And then that program developed into a department, and I moved from English to film, and I've been there ever since. But film is now a fully acknowledged academic discipline. We wow. even have a graduate program that's terrific at Brooklyn College, Firstine Graduate School of Cinema at the old Brooklyn Navy Yard, Steiner Studios, and I'm happy to be teaching there as well. So it's become, it's burgeoned into this really uh, robust academic field. But you're right, years ago when I started, it was regarded with suspicion. It's interesting because I've been doing research on this Blanche Walsh, who was my grandmother's second mother. She rescued my grandmother from an orphanage in London. It's like a movie in itself and brought her to New York. And Adolf Zucker put her in a film in 1912 uh, based on Tolstoy's third novel, Resurrection. And it was actually Zucker who created the feature film because he felt that before that, you had these one reel, two reels. They didn't really have a plot or a story. And Zucker felt that audiences were ready for a full-length story movie, like a novel or like a play. So there are interconnections between literature and cinema and theater. And you, I think, kind of get into that, because you also have an interest in theater also. Talk about your interest in theater. Uh, you have done extensive work on the group theater as well, and the group theater which got involved with Hollywood. Uh, maybe you can, we can educate our audience about that. I, I am very interested in theater, yeah. but it is unusual for a film person to be interested in theater. Yeah, it's, it's unusual. unusual. It's unusual. It's, it's not at all the regular thing. and. At school, as a matter of fact, there's almost no connection between the film department and the theater department. It's as if we occupy separate universes. And my film students, I asked, do you go to the theater? Not, not so much. They love movies, they want to find out about movies, they want to make movies, but the impulse is very different from being a playwright or being interested in theater. There, there's still distinct fields, believe it or not. There's not a lot of reciprocity between the two. Wow. So my interest, I happen to love theater and go to Broadway, yes. but that's unusual for a film person. This, unusual. This speaks to a kind of fragmentation in our, in our society, and including in academia, and the lack of interdisciplinary discourse. Do you find this is true? Like, we're trying to bring people together with our show. I think we could bring people together in this apartment. I <laughs> look around. Claudia, look at this beautiful couch. Take a look. Uh, we could have a salon here. We could have a theater person. One of the persons we're trying to bring together with you is Molly Haskell, who was a former guest on our show. We're working on that. So, uh, to, how, is it, is it uh, you know, who else out there besides you is interdisciplinary? Can you think of anybody else who sort of crush, crosses genres? Or? Well, well, there are a lot of, of film people now who are very political. And so there's a there's a there's very much a connection between film and politics and uh, and political history and film history. So there's a real connection Spike there. Lee, for, well, for one example among many, okay. but certainly there's a the social change that you're interested in is very much reflected in contemporary filmmaking. Often, films by minority directors and producers, of course. Yeah, so that, that there's an opening there. So history yeah. and film and politics and film, wow. lots of cross-fertilization. So now that I have the professor here, uh, this is wonderful. I'm just finishing up a book by, about Sam Goldwyn, uh, who was one of those great titans. He came after Zucker. He idolized Zucker. Everybody idolized Zucker. He was the first guy there, but, but it was Goldwyn who came along, who built up M MGM and had his own company. But... People criticized him for, for being a, a bit of a, 
you know, he 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 wanted to, films to be popular. He wanted uh, to be taken seriously as an intellectual, but the guy didn't read. You know, he was not very well read. Uh, but yet he brought out Wuthering Heights. It was such a contradiction between his aspirations uh, for uh, intellectual credibility, let's say. What, what's your take on, on Goldman? Goldman yeah. had great instinctive taste. Okay. Okay. And he knew things you couldn't find in books. So he, you know, he was very shrewd. And he was a pioneer. He helped to found the industry. He's probably the, the first great independent producer. He left Gold, uh, Metro Goldwyn Mayer and became his own boss and, and made many wonderful films over the years. William Wyler was his great director. Betty Davis, one of his great stars. And his last yeah. film yeah. is one I have a particular affection for, yes. and that is Porgy and Bess. It doesn't have many fans, but I'm one of them. Okay. It's in effect a lost film, but I've had the honor of hosting screenings. The rare screenings in the last 10 years have been because I've prodded and gotten rare prints. We had to, the last screening was in Cleveland, and the only available print was from the Finnish archive. So it's virtually a lost film, but the film was made by Goldwyn as his swan song, and he wanted it to be a replication of his favorite show, the original folk opera that he saw on Broadway in 1935, Porgy and Bess. Probably the greatest of all American musicals. Is it an opera? It's a, mus a musical. It's both. And Goldwyn, that he, think of that. He ended his career with the filming by Otto Preminger of a great American opera. So I, I think in, in, in terms of history, the credibility that you say he really was after, I'm hoping in time that the achievement of that film, as his last statement, his farewell, will be seen for what it is. So you mentioned Otto Preminger. He is one of the directors that you have a fascination uh, uh, with and uh, was known as being very autocratic also. What was it that uh, interested you most in, in, in Preminger? I, I always liked Preminger's films, okay. even when they didn't work. They're interesting. Yeah. I, I, I mentioned I'm hosting a screening of Skidoo at the Film Forum on March 8th. Okay. Skidoo is one of those great films that, that it's so bad that it almost comes full circle and it's sort of good. It's a fascinating failure and a time capsule of the late 60s. But even when his projects didn't work, they had something interesting about them. And he loved what I love about movies, which is long takes and long shots and elegant camera movement. Today, yeah. cut, 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 close up, close up, close up, uh -huh. camera never stops moving. When Otto Preminger moved the camera, it was for a reason, and he loved to stay back. And so you saw if two characters had something to say to each other, if he was filming this conversation, mm -hmm. the camera would be at a certain distance. He would not cut back and forth between us. We would be in the same shot the entire conversation mm -hmm. with the camera there patiently looking at us. Today, any director would shoot this conversation, cut, you, me, back, forth, cut, 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 and there would be no sense of a, of a whole visual field. So I love that style, and Preminger believed Every cut is an interruption, so he liked long takes, beautifully planned and orchestrated. So his visual taste is similar to my taste. Yes. You know, I went back to your book on Woody Allen last night in preparation for this uh, dialogue, and I just uh, can't say enough about how much I admire him and his work, uh, and his particular certain films that stand out are one of them as Husbands and Wives, uh, which to me is a great realistic film about relationships, about the complicatedness of relationships, about New York City, the love of New York, about the love of literature. He mentions Dostoevsky in that film. That's a film I've actually shown to my students, to my writing students, to get them interested in writing and the intellectual life. And I, I watch the film, I put it on, and I sit in the back of the room, and I watch how everyone is entranced. And these are students, Foster, who had, have had no exposure to cinema. All right. So I've taught at community colleges in places like Newark, New Jersey, and working class kids and poor black and Latino kids who their idea of movies, and I'll, I'll write on the board, movies versus cinema. Does anyone know the difference you know, between just a regular popular movie you know, and a serious film? 
and they don't know it. So I use Woody Allen to introduce them to that, and it's just a wonderful way to do it, and it gets them all thinking and writing and engaging. And uh, so I went back to that, your book on Woody Allen, which is phenomenal, and um, just it was good to be reminded about how interested in philosophy he is. So this is a man who was a true thinker, and... It's a shame he's being marginalized now. He's being attacked, and I don't want to get into the whole that whole thing. But whatever, uh, he was found innocent, you know. But uh, I actually met him a, f a few months ago, filming uh, the new one, the film "Rainy Day in New York," and I happened to stumble upon the uh, filming, and I. It was really interesting. I got to have a little interaction with him, and it's, it's something I treasure. Uh, the man is a genius. I think he's really, what he did to film, he brought humanity into film, and he made it okay to be, uh, you know, not a perfect Cary Grant type of, a, uh, you know, good looking, you know, you could be a little nebbish, and you could have doubts and insecurities, and you could still be uh, sort of popular and cool. So anyway, what, what, what's your take on Woody Allen? As you're speaking, I'm reminded of my original interest, and it seems here's somebody who says he doesn't like comedy, but did write a book on Woody Allen, which I updated twice, yes. a, a second edition and a third edition. Yes, yes, yes. I think part of it is that at his best, his films are not pure comedy. They're mm -hmm. comedy in a mixture of something else, mm -hmm. a sort of drama or philosophy, or there, there's a, a level of thoughtfulness and a mixture of tone, really. And for me, his masterpiece is Crimes and Misdemeanors, yeah. which, of course, has funny elements, but a lot of it is anything but funny. Very dark, very dark, very dark view of the world. I think, that, I think that is his masterpiece. Annie Hall is magnificent. But those two, I would call his masterpieces. After a certain point, after I had updated the book twice, in early, about 2001, 2002, something happened, and I felt... I wish him well, but I think I've done my Woody Allen bit. I need to move on. And I've seen almost nothing in the la of Woody Allen in the last 15 years. Midnight in Paris, which I liked a lot, but maybe one or two others. So I've just missed. I can't speak about him from any time after about 2000. But up until then, I was fascinated. But he, he may make too many movies. Yeah almost compulsively a movie or two a year maybe they become i hear repetitive of course, how could they not be right. and so i think yeah. the level of inspiration is inconsistent wow. but when he was at his best i mean crimes and misdemeanors is an american masterwork right you can talk about that film i haven't stopped thinking about that yeah. film yeah. since i saw it sure it's so it is so thought-provoking it's powerful uh, you know, you talk about the dark side of uh, that film, and uh, that makes me think about your interest in noir and how you were actually one of the early champions of noir. Uh, on Sunday mornings, Claudia makes pancakes, and we sometimes put on the uh, Turner Classics that has uh, Eddie Muller introduced, which he does a tremendous job of introducing those films. But, but they all owe a debt to you for really creating interest in this. How did that happen? How, what was there a particular film that you said, hey, you know, the, we have to, this is a whole new genre? How did you, how did you help to champion noir? Yeah, interesting question. I, there was a film noir series at the old Thalia Theater on Broadway and 95th Street. And I went to it pretty regularly for a couple of weeks. And I thought, gee, these films are interesting. And they're really good. And I saw that there'd been no book at that point written, none. So I went to a publisher that I had already published with and, and offered a proposal about a history of film noir. And the publisher said, well, we'll sign it up, but we can't give you much money and we can't send you to Washington. In those days, there was no DVD. You had to go to the Library of Congress to see a lot of films. We can't give you a travel budget because we feel this book and this subject have very limited interest. Oh, wow. And the book was published in 1981. It is still in print, and I get royalties twice a year. <laughs> so he was wrong. He was wrong. <laughs> but at, in those days, film noir, I, I started researching it in mid-70s. Film noir was basically an unknown commodity. 
And of course, since it's become extraordinarily popular, and thanks to Eddie Muller, who's the president and founder of the Film Noir Foundation, dedicated oh. to the preservation and the honoring of film noir. And I'm happy to say I sit on his board of directors. Oh. So I know him well, and he does a terrific job at TCM. And he's been America's leading spokesperson for yeah. film noir. Yeah. And he is truly the czar of noir. Wow. But I'm older than Eddie. I'm yeah. older than anybody. So I was there before him. Uh. And he likes to say when he introduces me that I've forgotten more than he'll ever know. It's not true. It isn't true. It's not true. But he says it. It's very kind of him. It, he knows more than anybody. But, but in fact, I was there earlier than other people. And now, this proliferation of courses on film. Well, I won't teach one, by the way. I don't want. I don't want to teach one. No. It's like with. I still love film noir, but I don't want to teach it. I don't want to teach yeah, it. Yeah, I want to teach. I'm teaching Iranian cinema now. It's oh, always yeah. interesting something to new, go to yes. keep alive and do something you don't right, know that right. much about and you have to find out about. Uh, but film noir is a fascinating style, okay. and some of the great, greatest of all American films, I think, would fall under the noir rubric. Mm, wow. So here we are. It's February 2018. The Oscars. We're, the up. countdown is on, and we have with us Foster Hirsch, the great film historian. What's your take on this year's crop? Just give us a quick analysis. The, the Frank, tr truthful, truthful, yeah, I want the truth. candid, Please, honest opinion, back. don't hold back. <laughs> I'm not excited about any of the films. Wow. Um, the three leading contenders, I haven't seen all of them, but I've seen a number, but the three leading contenders I think are all seriously flawed in one way or another. The Shape of Water, v visually very stylish, mm -hmm. and Sally Hawkins plays that role with great delicacy, okay. I, and the, the acting is lovely, but I don't quite buy the story, and I don't really, if I can be very candid, like the film's ideology, mm -hmm. because it's about getting the white man and a lot of films are now about that. The white boss is the villain. Right, right. And so you have the gay man and the woman who can't speak and the black woman. So all the marginalized figures get against him and we all like them and why not? They're wonderful characters, but we hate the white boss. And there's a lot of that going on in films now. A lot of that. And that's, I, I think that's unfair in a different direction. I think we have to have to be balanced about something like that. The other uh, film that I simply don't understand, Three Billboards, yeah. don't I don't get it. it. I don't get it. And I have to say, Frances McDormand, who's going to get the Oscar, she's awfully pleased with herself. Too much so. Oh, my God, is she pleased with herself. <laughs> okay. And it's, it's, uh. it's a lot of shtick and mannerism and winking at the audience. And uh, I, 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 I find her hard to take, I have to admit. Yeah, and the ego keeps getting larger and larger. But I don't, I don't get that film. I don't understand okay. what it's about. I really don't see why it's landing. The other film, very nice, Lady Bird. Okay. Lovely, lo beautifully written, beautifully acted. Yes. It, it seems, in the end, kind of ordinary or minor yeah. um, okay. a, a nice little slice of life I don't think I quite get the leading character after spending two hours I don't think I know who she is um, and the other film I Tanya which is beautifully made and beautifully acted but I wonder why all this skill and artistry over this character I'm not sure that she's worth our time and mm. I, I, I think ultimately it's it's a minor film, wow. ultimately minor. Okay. I hear the Phantom Thread is excellent, and I was told I should see it, but I haven't. Okay. And what about the post? the post? I haven't seen that. Okay. It's interesting. Now you're making me think also about a larger problem in our society of a dumbing down, which is what we talk about a lot on our show, since uh, we see our show as a kind of university, as a fusion of a talk show and a university, since I have one foot in the academy as an English professor, and I see a lot of the uh, corporatization of the universities, and they're taking out the humanities, they're taking out philosophy and literature and culture, and they're putting in, they're putting in like marketing 101, right? So my 
my question I, to you and the world is, are we getting to a point where people are settling for mediocre movies? Uh, and it, does it have to do with the, um, the breakdown in our educational system? So, so you, you studied English literature, and you got into film from literature, so maybe you have some thoughts on that. I think what you're saying is, is certainly true, but I always am a little nervous about making predictions about the current crop, because nobody knows, including me, what these films will look like 20, 30, 40, and 50 years from now. I'm working now, as you know, on a history of the 1950s, so enough time has gone by that I think we can assess those films from the period that have passed the test of time and those that haven't. I'm sitting here making these pronouncements about Three Billboards and I, Tanya and Lady Bird and, um, uh, and Shape of Water, but I don't know how those films are going to look decades from now. It may be that one among them will really hold up and look really interesting, and the others may fade and, and into oblivion. It's very hard to know what the what are but people after us will think about what the films of the moment. So I make the statements, and I'm sure I'm making my opinions very clear, but I could be wrong. So I'm, I always tell students, you don't need me yeah. to talk about the current films, but you do need me to help you navigate the films of the past. So I, I guess I'm saying I feel more comfortable in the past, which is why I'm a, an historian. The, 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 present, the present has all kinds of questions and uncertainties yeah. that nobody can answer, and you never know what the legacy is going to be. Right. You can't f know for sure. Right. Well, since you're working on this magnus opus about the 1950s, maybe you could say, what would you say your top three favorite 1950s movies are, all right? And just give us quick, a quick snapshot on each one, okay? Okay, so preview of coming attractions yes. in a way as I'm working on I think the greatest film of the 1950s, one of the greatest American films, is On the Waterfront. Best acted film I've ever seen. Yes. It's also a political allegory. It's a moral allegory. It's a beautifully made work of film art in every department, from acting to directing to Leonard Bernstein's score to Bud Schubert's extraordinary script. Nobody writes dialogue today like that famous taxi club, oh, taxi cab scene. Yeah, could, have been a, could have been a contender. It was you, Charlie. It was you. I mean, that scene is amazing. Yes, yes. Beautifully written, acted, directed, everything. The other film that comes to mind is a film noir, and it's one of the greats. It's, it's among the greatest star vehicles I've ever seen. Sudden Fear with Joan Crawford. Do you know it? 1952. I don't know. I don't know. Got to go home and see it. it Sudden Fear, Joan Crawford, Gloria Graham, Jack Palance. Mm. Fabulous thriller. Palance. Yes, fab. He was Oscar nominated, and so was Joan. Uh -huh. It's her. It's her greatest performance. Oh, my it's a terrific film noir about a woman in trouble, woman in jeopardy. She marries the wrong guy, and boy, does she have a lot of problems. <laughs> oh, wow. And I, I think. Uh, just off the top of my head, the third would be, in my mind, the greatest epic ever made in America, William Wyler's Ben-Hur. Oh, okay. Yes. It's, I think, holds the record for the number of Oscars, and you can't mm -hmm. go by that as an indication of quality, oh. but that's a great film, and I think it holds up. They knew what they were doing. It's a beautifully made Hollywood epic, and I love epics, so yeah. this is an extraordinary one. So those three off, off the top of the uh, off top of my head. You see no comedies in that list. <laughs> so I always feel like this movie On the Waterfront is a part of my life, because we live in Hoboken. Claudia and I, and we walk by these cobblestone streets that you actually see in the movie, in the parks, and it's sort of, I actually know some of those old timers who were extras in the movie. Some of them are still walking around, so I feel this connection. In the square in front of it's still there. Both of those churches that they use, they, they cut, they're still there. I walk through, it's right there. So it's all part of like my daily life of being in Hoboken. You can feel that film. And then my dad, who was an actor when he was a young man and gave up the acting dream, despite that Chester Morris was his director, wanted to take him on the road with uh, the K Mutiny Court Martial. But he got married and he wanted to be a stable family man and he gave that up. And he, 
but it was always something frustrated that when he looks back and he says, uh, he says it jokingly, he'll say, I could have been a contender. I could have been a contender. So that, that line. But not entirely jokingly. Not entirely. entirely. There's a little bit of, yeah. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. A little subtext. A little subtext. <laughs> That's right. That's correct. So, yeah. So uh, what, what you think that if you had to give advice to Hollywood today, if they would bring you in and say, like, what, what direction should we go in uh, for films to be more popular but also more humanizing uh, what would you say for them I think the, the what are, I think that what are they call the tentpole films the big blockbuster films the Marvel comic series have done a great damage to yeah, yeah. Hollywood filmmaking and audience expectations I would say to all filmmakers yes. if you move the camera move it for a reason cameras are in hyperactive overdrive because they're afraid of audiences having a limited attention span, which may well be true. We all have all these devices. I would say slow down your filmmaking, more dialogue, mm -hmm. long takes, long shots, the emphasis on close-up after close-up after close-up, cut, 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 and no dialogue. A film, a lot of people, I must say this, because a lot of people like it, but this one I think is really pernicious and a bad example for filmmaking is Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk, a filmmaker I do not like. Right, okay. And I, I, I despise that film. Mm -hmm. There's no script, there's, there are no characters, mm -hmm. there's no scene. Yeah. It's all about close-ups and being in the moment. We, he wants to throw us into the middle of warfare and the chaos of being at war. I got it in five minutes. I didn't need to have be in the middle of chaos for two hours with a story that I couldn't follow and characters, there are no characters, so I couldn't identify with any of the characters. It's almost inhumane the way he treats the characters. All the young boys in the film look alike and they have thick accents. You couldn't understand them. There's not, I saw it at the Cinerama Dome which has the best sound system in America. I couldn't understand any of the dialogue, virtually any of it, and I realized that's just the way he wanted it. It's not about dialogue. It's about action and being in the middle of things, and that camera never stops moving. There are a few times he has a great long shot. He cuts away from the long shot within 10 seconds. And so we get close-up after close-up, and there are three time frames that happen simultaneously, which adds an unnecessary layer of complication. I went into the film knowing very little about the historical Dunkirk. I exited the film knowing less. less. Oh, my goodness. There you go. Telling it like it is on West 12th Street, okay, in Greenwich Village with Foster Hirsch, the great film critic and historian. Uh, Foster, what advice would you give to people who want to have better conversations about film? One of the things that I love about New York and about places like the Film Forum and the Quad, you can overhear these most intensely intellectual discussions about, about movies. And how would you empower people to have opinions that they could actually discuss films better, and do you think it also has to do with reading and learning about cinema? What, how, what, would, in, what would increase the quality of film conversations today? Well, uh, well, a lot of the theaters like the Film Forum, like the Quad, yeah. like the Metrograph, oh, the, new down, the new one downtown, hipper oh. than thou, no signage outside. No sign, oh right? no, you, you have to know where it is, you yeah. can walk yeah. right by, super, super <laughs> hip. But, but these, these, these repertory theaters, which happily seem to be expanding, sure. have many programs where the filmmakers are there, or somebody from the film is there, yes. and they talk to the audience, and that gives the audience a chance to exchange ideas. That in-person and personal touch is a wonderful way of getting the kinds of dialogue and conversations you're asking for. Because you and I are both language people, we were both English majors, so to me I think it is interesting and it's important that when someone gets up to speak about the film, you're watching someone put it into words and make sense out of it through language, through conversation. Whenever I watch Turner Classics, I, I have to always watch, you know, what they say before and what they say after the because that's of part of the whole experience. The idea is, here's a movie yeah. and, and we talk about movies. There are things to say about movies. So Turner has done a wonderful oh. job of not only showing great films, but promoting discussion of great films. 
that's that's what you're talking about, isn't it, John? Yes, yes, to I talk have. about films. To talk about films. Now, here is the million dollar question, okay? And I'm going to look at the camera. What can we do to get you on Turner Classic, talking to Ben Mankiewicz, and actually have you there? What do you think about that? Well, I, I'm hoping when my 50s book comes out in 2020 that I will be able to promote it on uh, Turner. Well, I, again, it, to me, it goes beyond promotion. It goes, it goes. It's it's an honor and a pleasure uh, to be in a dialogue with a great film professor, a great film educator. I I, I would. I you to say all I, yeah. <laughs> 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 Under the table, we got uh, <laughs> okay. How do your students react to you in class? What's it like uh, teaching teaching cinema? Yeah, uh, they. I'll tell you, a, a, a colleague of mine years ago said to me, my students think of me as a person who has no opinions. And I said, well, <laughs> that is not the way my students think of me. Because I'm very frank about my opinions. I have told all my classes how much I hate Dunkirk and I, how bad I think the example of Christopher Nolan's filmmaking is and how pernicious an influence he is. And I'm very direct in my opinion. I feel teachers should be. But my colleague had a very different approach, that the teacher should not impose her or his opinion in a discussion. I don't agree. I, I, I'm, I'm, I react to movies personally. This is what I like. Here are the reasons. This is what I don't like. Here are the reasons. And then the good teacher, and I hope I fall into that category, doesn't insist that the students agree with him. Wow. It's a question of discussing. Yes. You know, this is how I feel. How do you feel? Right. You may not agree. Right. And they, I have given A's to students who have written on films I personally don't like or can't really respond to, but they've written beautifully argued commentary, and they deserve the grade. Well, you and I should keep this conversation going because central to my philosophy of teaching, of teaching English, right, of teaching people how to think and write and, and speak is watching films with my students. And I'm developing that pedagogy. And so knowing you is very important. And also, um, I have a new play, a one-man show that I'm developing. It's called A Real Education a real education, what they forgot to teach you in school. That's the tagline, what they forgot. That's a pro provocative tagline. And the forgot is in quotes, because did they really forget, you know, or did they forget on purpose, you know? To teach people the things and to be more humane and to think critically and to have philosophy and all these things that I think we're, they're getting short shrift in our, in our, in our colleges. Um, so, uh, yeah, so going forward, are, are you, Optimistic? Are you pessimistic about the future of film? Absolutely optimistic. Okay. Absolutely. The independent films, the chances are absolutely broadening. There are more opportunities for people. We have wonderful students in our graduate program at Brooklyn College at Fierstein who are making exciting new experimental films. We're not just following the templates but doing something new. I think there's vast opportunity out there now and because it's less expensive with new digital media less expensive than film it's easier to make films so there are many many options for independent filmmaking that will be exciting i'm i'm a little pessimistic about yes. the tentpole comic book filmmaking i don't want that to mushroom any more than it has i mean they all look alike to me one film yeah, looks like the other. I, I've said to students, let's ban all special effects in filmmaking for the next 50 years. Wow. No special effects. Well, I want to have a summit meeting on this, okay? <laughs> and Foster, you're going to preside over this. We could have it right here in your place. And let's get Spielberg here. Let's get them all. Let's get De Niro. Let's get the top people in film, all right, to sit and focus on this issue because I think you're absolutely right. It is creating a, an effect of dumbing down, an effect of uh, uh, desensitizing people, uh, and, uh, you know, AD, ADD or ADHD. It's it's feeding it's I think it's feeding all into that so um, so great so are are you reading any good books on film lately what what has been your reading life in terms of reading about cinema and, and well I'm since I'm teaching a course in Iranian cinema and that's I have an Iranian friend and when I told him that he said 
well, what do you say? <laughs> I'm not Iranian and it's not my background. So I'm doing a lot of reading on Iranian culture and Iranian history and Iranian cinema. And I must say, Iranian cinema is very close to the greatest national cinema from a country that has the kind of government that it has and produces the kind of cinema that it's been producing. It's an extraordinary example of the, the triumph of the human spirit. The, this country of this, the repression and the political and sexual and moral repression and these great films are made with great subtext. So I'm reading the films against the grain of post-revolutionary Iranian culture. And so that's, I'm focused on that now. I'm focused on Iran because I have to keep ahead of the kids. It's not, it's not my training. It's not my background. So I've got to really bone up. I love the films, but I'm obviously presenting them as an outsider. I can't present them from within the culture. Did you see Agnes Varda, the new one, Faces Places? What would you think of that? She's always extraordinary. She always has been, yeah. Extraordinary, yeah. A, 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 a remarkable figure. And also, she was on Turner Classics with Molly Haskell. They had a dialogue with her there. Yeah, we're trying to bring Molly together with you and have a discussion. So, also, you know, um, there's a Bergman Festival going on right now and at the Film Forum. I'm very tempted to see uh, Persona today. So, this is what, the, of all of the films that are at that festival, Persona, Wild Strawberries, and Scenes from a Marriage. Those are the three, top three that I think of. Are you, are you going to go there, or which would you recommend? I know, I've taught Bergman a lot, and so I know his films. Have I seen all of them? Almost, probably. But Persona is the great one in my mind. You can't miss it. Okay. You've got to go there. It's a go. fascinating, en enigmatic, okay. puzzling. You'll, you'll think about it. What did he mean by that? What does this mean? Very puzzling and mysterious, but in a good way. It, it provokes you to analyze and to think and reflect. You won't figure it all out. He doesn't want you to. But there are all kinds of images, and then you have to sort of connect the dots. It's a fascinating film. Wow. What do you, how long have you been working on the 50s book? Are you been working, are you, is that a longer time than you normally? And what, why do you think that is? In, a, in effect, I've been working on the 50s book for over 60 years, since I started going to movies as a kid in the 50s. So that actually may be the last line of the book, because I'll say, um, people ask me, how long have you been working on the book? And the truthful answer is about 65 years. The more realistic answer is for about the last six or seven. Yes, it has taken longer. Right. Uh, I want this to be definitive. I'm covering far too many films, and my first draft is going to be over a thousand pages, so I've got to cut, 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 cut before I send it to my editor. But it, I think it's going to be pretty inclusive. It's everything. It's not just certain kind of filmmaking. It's the major films, the minor films, the teenage films, the, the literary masterpieces. It's everything of this very extraordinary period of filmmaking. You know, since our show is about education and the arts and social change, we always like to pivot back to those three categories. Can you think of um, possibilities for film in terms of really changing the world or maybe even saving the world? People say now, you know, people distrust Donald Trump with his finger on the nuclear button. We have wealth inequality. We have environmental destruction going on. What do you say to Hollywood? you think if a really great film came out or a series of films that it could really help save the world? I think there's so many topics that are ripe for being presented today because of the political situation. But part of the problem with, with that is we have become so polarized. I mean, each side, let's be honest, Republicans demonize Democrats, Democrats demonize Republicans. There's, it, there's almost no chance for a dialogue. I inter like to flip back and look at the news at night. You look at CNN, you look at Fox, they're reporting on the same subject from totally different perspectives and a totally different interpretation of, quotes, the facts or the information that's available. Totally, so it's totally partisan on each side. With, 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 so it would be very hard for a film now 
to speak to the political issues of the moment, and they are pressing without that kind of demonization of the other. We become so fragmented. Yeah. Remember in the 50s, we had a president everybody loved, yeah. named Eisenhower. Eisenhower. If you were a Democrat or Republican, yeah. you believed in him, you had confidence in him. Uh, there was a certain, you, he exuded a certain decency, and we believed in that patriarchal figure as our president. Yeah. And it, Democrats and Republicans weren't e at each other's throats the way they are now. Mm. Is that going to change? Are we going to be continue to be so polarized? Yeah, I know. To me, one of my great uh, political films that I ever saw was uh, Bullworth with Warren Beatty, and I thought that was a really great uh, film. And I think Beatty is to be applauded for his work for Reds yes. and for pushing the envelope yes. in that way. Okay. Um, so um, anyway, Claudia. Is it time to take a little stroll here in Foster's lovely apartment? We're going to just walk around and look at some beautiful artifacts and, and treasures from, from film, from the f culture of film. Let's take a look at that. So why don't we start with this beautiful lamp that was illuminating our conversation. This belonged to who? That's Greta Garbo's lamp. That's her. The, the shade isn't, but the actual lamp stand is hers is hers but the the rug that we are standing on now was designed by garbo it's her favorite colors and it was in the foyer of her apartment on east 52nd street for decades and here it is right here this is this is garbo's rug designed by garbo herself oh my goodness and this is what's this painting of garbo by her brother sven how old would she be in that painting it's hard to say. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of an abstract uh, figure. Let's let's look around. Okay, I want to show the Buddha. Let's show the Buddha. Okay, I like the Buddha because you are like a Buddha type figure, uh, Foster. You're very calm and gentle and soft spoken. Okay, you're very nice to say that. No, but that's that's that's. Uh, uh, picked up in India, as a matter of fact, on a travel to India. Okay. And now let's, oh, there's Garbo. Anna Karenina, now this is very meaningful to me, uh, Foster, because uh, the Anna Karenina, this actress who was my grandmother's second mother, Blanche Walsh, she starred in the play version of Tolstoy's third novel, the one everybody forgot about, which is called Resurrection, which was his most radical, provocative, political, and best-selling novel. But his other two novels were War and Peace and Anna Karenina, and there is Garbo in Anna Karenina. There it is, yes. And there's Garbo and Robert Taylor. In uh, Camille, okay. French poster. Ah. Yes. And the here's the salt and pepper okay. shaker owned by Garbo, and that was her favorite color that pink. You can see it here as well in the rug. Uh, what was it about Garbo and you? What, what was it about Garbo that well, you loved? The greatest of all the Hollywood actresses. <laughs> Nobody greater. Uh, yeah. And Kazan, who knew a thing or two about acting, said that the two finest film performances of the yeah. 20th century, in his opinion, Brando in On the Waterfront and Garbo in Camille. Uh, Those were the two greatest performances he's ever seen by male and female. Quick, quick story. In 1934, uh, Sam Goldwyn uh, was trying to make a star out of Anna Sten. Yes. So he made a movie called We Live Again, which was the resurrection story. That's the same yes. story that Blanche Wall started in 1912. And he couldn't make a star out of Anna no, Sten. That was no. a great disappointment. No. She... she yeah. She didn't have what Garbo had. Garbo let you in. See, the uh, face let you in. The camera would go close to Garbo, yes. and she would sh create the illusion of showing you everything. Uh, and Anna Sten was <gasps> closed off. So fast forward to like 1995, I was married to my first wife in Hoboken and I would bring my daughter to the parks in the summertime. She was five years old, my daughter Alyssa, and my daughter would play with a little girl who was the daughter of Tony Goldwyn who is Sam Goldwyn's grandson, was living in Hoboken at the time. So the girls would play, and Tony and I would talk. We would talk movies. And he was also very interested in education. And at the time, I was studying for my master's at NYU in English education. He wanted So we would have these deep discussions about education, about films, and all that. But his daughter's name was Anna. Oh. 
and I thought, I wonder if the because his grandfather he tried so hard to make he, to make the star of Aniston. Yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering if that was not a nod. To, it, it, may <laughs> it may very well have been. Now you also have a chair that belonged to. Th this or, chair belonged to Lillian Gish's mother. Okay. It's, it has a, a different cover on it, but that that old-fashioned chair. I think that those chairs have a name. Oh yes. This a cert, the, okay. a certain style of of the uh, uh, period. Who was Lillian Gish for our audience who might not know? Lillian Gish was often called the first lady of the American cinema. Oh. She was a star in the okay. in teens, uh -huh. uh, created by D. W. Griffith. Oh, D. W. Yeah. Griffith. Do you think people don't know who Lillian Gish is now? Well, I mean, the younger people might not people know. Don't. Yeah. The younger yeah. people wouldn't know who Garbo is either. Right, right. Unfortunately. Uh, I found that the two figures that students know from yes. the past, yes. meaning 50, 60 years ago, there are, there are two or three I can count on. And uh, uh, when I ask for a show of hands, all the hands go up. Uh, Marilyn Monroe, okay. they all know that name. Right. They all know James Dean. And they all know the name Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley, who was three. Okay. When I was a child, when I was a teenager, Elvis was my hero. I wanted to be the next Elvis, and I'm still trying. <laughs> I'll be the Elvis of television if I can if I can do it. But let's walk this way. Let's just walk and talk as we. I love these curtains. When you walk into your apartment, it's like a dramatic entrance with these curtains. It's like a. It's like ta-da! Look! 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 Ta-da, ta-da. <laughs> it's like, right? Now let's walk over to the chair that was uh, owned also by Greta Garbo. And look at these artifacts here. Beautiful African, you're into African art? Yes. Okay. Exotic. Cool. Excellent. This is oh, let's see that one. An original watercolor, Noel Coward's gift to Lillian Gish. Yes, gift, gift to Lillian Gish. One of the great writers and playwrights. Yes. And, yes. Yes. and now this door. Can we open this door? Here we go. Another magic room. Oh, hi, there's someone in there. You want to <laughs> say hello? Surprise, surprise. Come, in, come, in. come on in, look at that. Such a pleasure to meet you. Hey, oh, come on inside. Keep the camera rolling. This is spontaneous. This is spontaneous. And uh, tell, us, tell us your name. Uh, Christoph Bathory. I'm John. It's a pleasure to meet you. How do you do? My wife, Claudia. Don't get up. Filming. Okay. So now this is... Here, right? What is this room? Tell us about it. Uh, these, this, is, uh, this is the exotic uh, room uh, which includes many of Garbo's artifacts, such as her chairs here. These are uh, oh, is... Garbo's chairs. Okay. She often had a love of putting these colors together. And plus uh, her briefcase over here. You can see her initials. GG oh, here, G -G. and above is her art uh, box, because after she gave up acting and she moved to New York, she didn't know what to do with her creative gifts, so she became an artist and she painted. <laughs> oh. so, uh, anyway, part of the mysteries of Garbo. Fantastic. I'm going to sit. In, can I sit in Garbo's yes, chair? Please, please. Wow. This is a, I want a drum roll for this. Look at this. Yes. Wow. What a room. What goes on in this room? Uh, a lot of thinking and reading and a te this is where the television is. It's like a little movie theater, you know? It's a movie theater room. It has a bit of Egyptian uh, motif in the other room. Foster yes. can show you. Foster, show the Egyptian. The Egyptian motif. Let's see, Foster. The grand entrance. It's here. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> What movie? What okay? Yes, and what uh, movie does this evoke? Uh, the Mummy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the Double-headed Sphinx. So. Okay. <laughs> Which one? Boris Karloff. Yes, yes. Mm. Okay. Yes. Garbo's rain cap in the corner. Garbo's rain cool. cap. Okay. Walks in Central Park, so uh, oh, that's her little cool. rain cap. Oh, and Garbo's curtains. Garbo's oh, curtains. Yes. Okay. This gives you a better view of Garbo's. curtains. Oh my goodness, <laughs> this is if it's of interest. okay. But it's kind of a these hung on her in her private uh, abode on 52nd Street uh, oh. until she died. So it sort of captures a bit of the movie palace, I always think. And again, it's her, it's the colors that she always loved the green and the uh, pale pink there, dusty rose. Oh. Anyway, are you ready to take the show on the road with this? Uh, I'm charging 25 cents for admission. <laughs> now, did you ever get to meet Garbo Foster? Unfortunately, no. Uh, no, no, no.
who have you met in terms of your heroes in movies that uh, maybe you have a story or? Well, I can tell you the two finest people of all those I've interviewed would be the late, great Julie Harris. Oh, yes. Wonderful, okay. and uh, yeah. a wonderful man still with us, Tab Hunter. Oh, yeah. Couldn't be nicer. Couldn't yeah. be nicer. So my father was working backstage at the Playhouse on the Mall, and, oh, yes. and then he was working there, and then he wound up on Broadway at the Longacre Theater with the Belle of Amherst, working the lighting board. Julie Harris. Julie, Julie Harris, Harris yes. yes. I'm sure he liked her as much as everybody else did. Yes, yes, yes. yes a wonderful yes. person. Wow, this is fantastic. And uh, let me just tell you a quick story. When I met Woody Allen in October, it was on the streets of New York, and I just stumbled upon the set, and he was there, but he was hidden. You couldn't find him. He was like in this like tent, you know. So I was waiting and waiting and patient, and finally he came out, and he was going to walk by, but I had to say something to get his attention. I said, Woody, we love you, I said, right? But there was silence. Nobody said anything. And then so I said, I love you. <laughs> and then he it, he looked at me, he shook my hand, and he said, at least one? <laughs> so I got him to say something funny. <laughs> I, I, I floated home on a cloud. I said, I, got, I, I pitched a straight line to Woody. And he, so final thoughts here uh, from the great Foster Hirsch uh, in his Greenwich Village abode. Uh, the king of cinema. He, this man is the king of cinema, and we want to hear more of him and from him in and, and, and the world. We hope to see you more on, on Turner Classics and movie and places like that. Uh, final thoughts on our interview today. Today. Thanks for coming, and I'm glad I, you gave me an, uh, a platform to spout my opinions. I am opinionated. <laughs> Good. And don't stop doing that, okay? Thank you. Thank you. We love you, Foster. Thank you, Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.